Welcome, everyone. Hi, um, everyone. Uh, welcome for everyone who's joining us today for this very special edition of um, Baseball for All's live Q&A. And today we're featuring uh, Rachel Belkovic, and we're really excited about that. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Lena Park, and I head up the media and content and some of the program as programming aspects of Baseball for All, and I'll be your moderator of sorts today. Um, we also have on the call today, um, Justine Siegel, who's our founder. Um, she's on as well. Hi, Justine. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Rachel. Um, with that, I wanted to introduce Rachel and say that we're so honored to have her here with us today. Um, as most of you know, she has quite an impressive background um, within just the past seven years. Uh, she's worked for Major League Baseball organization as a strength and conditioning coach um, with teams like the Astros, the Cardinals, and the White Sox. Um, and she was also the first woman hired full-time to hold that position. Um, and as you all know, late last year, she was hired by the Yankees and became the first woman to be hired as a full-time hitting coach um, in professional baseball as a whole. Um, and we're so fortunate to have her join us today. Thanks for being here, Rachel. Um, just so you know, Rachel, I think you're on mute, sorry. All right, we're back. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm honored, first of all, that Justin would ask me to do this, but also I'm honored that I get the opportunity to talk to you guys. Like, this is just phenomenal and something I wish I had when I was your age. So I just, I'm so happy to be a part of this. So thanks for coming. Yeah. Um, and just a little context for you, Rachel, um, about who's on the call today. So we've got about 75 girls, women all across the world who play or coach baseball on with us today. So these girls are coming from all over the place, like as close by as like New York and California, Illinois and Alaska, but also as far as places as like Scotland and Canada and Mexico and Australia as well. Um, and so they'll be, like I mentioned before, they'll be typing in questions into the chat box and I'll be calling on folks um, so that they can ask their questions. Um, themselves. Um, but yeah, just to, a note to everybody before we get started, I'll be prioritizing um, players' questions first. So if you're not a player, please do write in your questions and we'll try to get to them as well. But just so you know, I'm, we're not ignoring you. We're just uh, prioritizing the players. Um, okay. So with that, uh, I wanted to have Fiona, who is a sixth grader from New York, um, kick things off for us with uh, her first question. Take it away, Fiona. Okay, hi. First of all, I just want to say, like, you're a really inspiring person, so, like, thank you for that. First off. Um, Fiona, you're inspiring me with your Yankees uniform. <laughs> I love it. I got Judge got on right now. That's awesome. If I was, if it wasn't quarantine, I probably would have brought my Yankees stuff, but all my Yankees stuff is at the field, so, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's, it's great. Okay, so, do you have any, like, since we're like stuck at home, do you have, or just in general, do you have like any workout routines for girls like us to kind of improve our hitting, particularly like power, like kind of? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I was just doing today myself and I, I don't, so my background is strength and conditioning just in case anyone needs like a little bit of um, understanding what that is. So I trained athletes in the weight room, lifting weights, and also doing conditioning and sprints and those kinds of things uh, for the first, I mean, majority of my career. And so I just went out to the park and was doing sprints myself, because I still like to train like an athlete that just feels the best to me. And I think anything with jumping, sprinting, um, any kind of weights that you have, which, I mean, if you pick up your dog, your brother, your, you know, whatever you have around the house, anything that's heavy, you got to get creative. Um, I wish I could show you, in fact, I'll, if you don't mind, I got to show you this. Yeah. I got to show you. You, you ask, you're going to get it. Okay. This is a Houston Astros baseball player, and he lives in the Dominican Republic. So I don't know if you can see this. He's squatting with two cinder blocks on a stick. So basically my idea for you guys and my encouragement while you're home is I think it's really easy. And this is also what I've been telling the Yankees players, you know, it's really easy right now to kind of wake up when you want and watch Netflix for six hours. And maybe you have some like Zoom school going on, but maybe you don't. 
supposed to so it's really easy to just be like very um lethargic and like feel lazy and tired i would just wake up and i would i'm recommending that the guys get three workouts in and that that could be 30 minutes but just kind of wake up your brain go out and and either do some just like running or sprints are even better so you asked specifically fiona about power if you want to get power you got to move fast so if you have weight that means you do jumps or you do something to develop your muscles but if you don't have weight even just running sprints or jumping like just today also i was jumping over a fence at a park and just being explosive as, as much as you can um it's tough with no equipment but you know what i just look at that player from the astros who I coached for three years and he is doing it with almost nothing. So I just encourage you to be creative and move as much as you can. I recommend once in the morning and once in the afternoon, because if you're sitting all day long, it just, your body becomes tired. I know everyone on this call knows what I'm talking about. You just, the longer you sit around, the less you want to get up and do stuff. So kind of just break up your day and get out, and get outside, even if it's cold and just kind of try to move your body around at the very least. If you want to develop power, I think sprints and jumping are your best bet with no equipment. If you have anything heavy, even if that's your little brother, pick it up and move it around. Develop your muscles. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, if I could ask a favor for um, everyone calling in, um, if you could, if you're not asking a question, if you could just put your um, microphone on mute just so that we don't get a bunch of background noise, I think that would be super helpful. So thank you guys. Um, so this next question comes from Addie, who's from St. Louis. Apparently she's a little shy to ask her question, but she'd love her question to be asked anyway. Um, she's asking, she's 11 from St. Louis, and she said, if you could pick one thing to look for in a hitter, what would it be? Uh, Mechanics-wise? Like on, in a swing, you mean? Yeah. Okay. She's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I usually just go straight for the hip. So I think that if you look at the center of the body, it's going to a lot of times dictates what's going on at the extension part of your body. So the distal parts is what we call that, your hands, your arms. So if you're in control of your hips, that's probably going to dictate a lot of what's going on in the rest of your body. So instead of like, I think a lot of talk about, okay, throw your hands to the ball, but if you're not in the right position, to get your hands to the ball, then you, you can't, you're not gonna be able to get there anyway. So I think the most important part of a swing is just your hips, or even you could generalize and say your lower half, your legs, um, because ultimately what is going on there is gonna dictate the rest of it. So going, diving a little deeper, you could say like um, flexing at the hips and rotating or getting in, I, I, I almost like, I just have the urge to stand up and demonstrate, but I won't do that. But um, like flexing at the hips and getting into a, an athletic position and then rotating away from the pitcher before you swing um, is where I would go first. So to lower half, hips, that's my, that's my answer. It was Addy, right? For Addy? Yep. Mm -hmm. From St. Louis. Yep. Great, cool. Good question. Great. Um, all right. We've got our next question comes from Olivia Pichardo and she's from New York as well. Olivia, go ahead. Um, hi. So, um, baseball is a game where you need to throw hard in order to make plays. And the average MLB position player will throw from like 85 to 95 miles per hour. So being a former um, strength and conditioning coach for the Astros, Cardinals, and White Sox, in your opinion, do you believe that a woman could be physically capable of fitting the strength standards to make it to the big league? Yes. That is kind of long. I do believe that. I don't know why, like there's, I know some women that can throw, you know, 70 ish miles an hour overhand. So, and probably maybe, maybe even someone on this call, but um, I do think that's possible. I don't know why we haven't seen that yet. However, I also know, you know, it's going to take, it's going to take a certain kind of woman, you know, there's some, there's some genetics involved in that. You're not going to see probably a 130 pound woman throwing 85 miles an hour, but at the same time, like you mentioned, from my strength and, strength and conditioning background, I think that part of why we haven't seen a woman is just like, you also aren't seeing a lot of women in the weight room lifting a whole lot of weight to get stronger, to live up to that standard or be able to do that. Um, I think it's possible. I think it's gonna take both some genetics and also some hard work in the weight room to get there. 
I mean, just simple by simple, like physiology, like you have to have a certain amount of tension in your muscles so that when you lay back your arm there, your muscles are stretched and then they snap back. And if you don't have a lot of tension, if you're just very like loose and you don't have a lot of muscle tone, that's not going to happen very easily. But yes, okay. to answer your question simply, yes, I believe it's possible. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, our next question is going to be coming from Samara, or I'm sorry, from Alexa, who's 11. Oh. Hey, Alexa. Hi. What were some barriers you faced because of your gender, and how did you overcome them? Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> some barriers that I faced. I mean, I, I was discriminated against when I was first getting into baseball. Like, I guess the barrier was I, I couldn't get a job. Um, and I was told that it was because I was a woman. So it was pretty clear. It wasn't like a, you know, and I, I know that Justine probably has felt this way. Like it wasn't a guessing game. Like, was it because I'm a woman or is it because I wasn't good enough? You're just not really sure, but I was told. Um, so there was some difficult times there. And I, what was the second part of the question? Cause I want to make sure I'm answering this accurately. Um, how did you overcome the barriers? Oh, how did I overcome? I mean, the, the short answer is I just didn't give up. You know, I think, I think there's probably many women who've been in just senior eyes position where they try one season and then they don't get a job and then they give up and go do, a, you know, they become a softball coach or a coach in a women's sport or whatever. And that's fine. Like I was a female athlete in college I, for softball. So that's wonderful. There are great opportunities. But I just decided that year it was 2013. Throughout that year, I was getting all kinds of opportunities for collegiate sports and for women's sports in college, like no men's sports. And I just said no. Like I didn't even get to an interview process because when someone would contact me about a job, I just would say I wasn't interested. So I was just basically willing to, by the way, be a waitress and work at Lululemon selling leggings which was not a job that I, I didn't want to pick up people's dirty dishes, but I was just willing to keep going down the path of like, nope, this is stick to my guns. Like, this is what I want to do. And I'm going to keep going down this road until I am just like, I blatantly cannot do it. Like there's no way that I can do it. So I wasn't, I think that the only thing maybe that was different between me and somebody else is I just kept going and when I had other opportunities, I didn't just say, oh, well, I guess I have a job opportunity to be a women's basketball strength coach. It's not really what I want to do, but it's a paying, it's a good paying job and it's a, it's a stable job. So I'll go do that. And I just kept going. Um, I don't want to forget to mention that it also is like this cataclysmic, like uh, perfect storm of events where I don't always say like, I'm not this pioneer that did something grand. It's, it's a wave and I'm a droplet of water in the wave. And so like Justine is part of that wave. Like if Justine hadn't come before me and kind of laid the foundation of like throwing batting practice, being an instructional league for the A's and kind of opening people's minds to the idea that, okay, you know, the A's hired a woman to do this. Why can't we hire a woman? You know? So I don't want to forget to mention like, how did I overcome that? Well, yeah, I did some things myself but also like the timing, right? You, you young ladies are living in an age where you can watch women on TV playing sports, period. When I grew up, when I was very young, I didn't, I couldn't even, women's sports weren't on, women playing sports were not on TV until I was like in high school. And when I think about women who are like, you know, Jess Mendoza and Kat Osterman and women who are elite level softball players, they didn't even have, they definitely did not watch women on TV. So I overcame some things by being resilient, yes, but also like the timing of society also allowed me to have that opportunity and just, you know, the Cardinals being open-minded enough to hire me was it, I mean, without that, I wouldn't have been hired. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, our next question will go to Kate Weller from California. Kate, what's up? California. It's pretty good. Pretty good, Weller. Um, uh, what do you think it's, or what is it like to be the first full-time working woman in the MLB? <laughs> um, I feel, 
I feel like in some ways I feel like it's just business as usual. This is my seventh spring training and uh, I feel pretty normal. I forget some days that I'm like a lady in the room until they go, okay guys and girls. And then they look at me. So I like, I forget that I'm even different. And so, you know, there's plenty of times where it feels like totally normal and it's just coaching, right? It's just human connection. It's just connecting with the players. Just like if I was coaching you young women, I would connect with you. It's just humans interacting and, once they know about that you care about them and that you're passionate and hardworking and that you're knowledgeable, pretty quickly that falls away. Um, so I feel pretty normal, although there's just some, I feel normal until I walk into the cafeteria in my baseball uniform and like everyone turns around and looks and I'm like, oh, right, I'm not normal, I forgot, or I'm, di I'm different than these people. Um, so for me, it's pretty normal. I will also say it, I, it's a true, like it's an honor and it's an honor to be a part of like I remember when Justine was hired it by the A's in instructional league and I remember last year when Veronica Alvarez who I'm sure you guys know about um, when she was hired in spring training like I remember these things and Jessica Mendoza and I remember looking at that and going okay like a I'm not alone you know there are other women out there that are having the same feelings of like there's no women's re restrooms and you're you're the weird one and they have to point out that you're the only girl in the room and there's certain things <laughs> I was in a, a scouting meeting with 50 guys the other day this was a few weeks ago I was in a scouting meeting and um they kind of so just a few of us coaches joined in the meetings just to listen to what to get an idea of our scouting philosophy and we were all sitting in the back of the room and they went down the line and they said oh we have some coaches joining us and the, here's so and so and so and so and so and so and then they got to me and they said and that's Rachel Blokovic she's the first ever woman hitting coach full-time to be in a major league organization and I just was like I'm at work guys like I'm just working here leave me like let me just work so um yeah that's that's like it feels normal until I, something like that happens but it also I'm fully aware that it's like an honor and it's a responsibility to you guys and it's a responsibility to the women who come before me to do a good job and to be available for these opportunities to speak to you young ladies. And so it's really, um, in some ways I feel totally normal. In some ways I feel this grand like purpose in life that I've been given by the women that have come before me. So it's, it's really cool. Thank you. Cool. Um, Kennedy from New Jersey actually has a, a related question. Kennedy, you wanna ask your question? Kennedy, what's up? How did the players and staff react when you first met them? Um, <laughs> they reacted just fine. You know, I think it's fair. Just like if, if anyone on this call has ever experienced a change where you've gone to a new school or you've moved to a new neighborhood or whatever, and you're getting adjusted and you're meeting new people, there's a, there's like a grace period of it's different right so people have asked me weird questions they you know they like i said they point it out they say all right guys and ladies and they look at me and it's just it's like there's been a few awkward conversations but overall they've been great and um there's plenty of guys which is really cool plenty of guys have said hey you know uh my little sister plays softball in college and um she thinks what you're doing is really cool so it's not all sometimes i walk into a room and um, Justine, I don't know if you can relate to this or even Lena, like, I almost think to myself, like, I don't, you know, ugh, all these guys hate me. You know, I almost have that in my mind when really they'll come up to me and say, Hey, uh, or even some of the older players, like, Hey, my daughter, my daughter is three. And I just love that you're doing this. And I, I love that she's going to have a role model besides me in baseball. And there's plenty of guys who appreciate it. Number one. But then really quickly, even if they don't like me or they, or I don't even say don't like me, I'm different, right? It's, it's new and I have to be empathetic to the fact that it's just change. And all of us deal with change differently. And so if they kind of act weird around me or maybe they don't respect me, you know, in a, in, as well as they respect male coaches, I just know that I have to earn that respect from them in a different way than a male coach would. And you know what? 
it's fine. I have to be empathetic to the fact that I'm different. And so overall, I would say they've been great. There's been a few like weird conversations, but again, I'm just like, all right, that's part of it. And that's not the first time this has happened because this is my seventh year. So I've had plenty of these conversations. And I think when I first got in, I might've gotten like offended or I feel bad about myself, but now I just look at them and I go, oh, well, okay, it, this is different for you and you'll get over it. And you'll see me work and you'll see my energy and you'll see my knowledge and you'll hear me talk and you'll be fine. But it's just gonna take a little more time for some guys than others. Good question. <laughs> um, our next question is going to be coming from 13 year old Leah. Take it hey. away, Leah. I just want to say that I really inspired me, but um, <laughs> what would you encourage girls in that play baseball to do to get to the level you are at now? Um, do you mean in coaching or do you mean playing like you, you me as a player or a coach? Um, like I play baseball right now, but mm -hmm. like getting to like a coaching level perspective. Well, what you're doing, what you're all doing, I assume either you're playing or coaching, what you're all doing is setting you up. I want to tell everyone this, what you're all doing right now, playing baseball is setting you up to have a better opportunity of getting a coaching job in the future than if you didn't. So you're all developing all of these skills as a baseball player and learning the game and I think what I didn't realize as a softball player is like, well, I, I did later when I was later in my college career, but these are valuable skills for becoming a coach someday. So what you're doing right now is phenomenal. I would encourage you, if you want, you can watch baseball. That's another great way to learn, right? Watch baseball, listen to what the analysts are saying, listen to how they're breaking down the game, coaching podcasts, co you know, there's plenty of great, baseball coaching podcast, the ABCA one um, just comes to mind off the top of my head, but you can listen to what college coaches are thinking and how they're developing their rosters and what they're thinking in certain situations. I think there's a ton of resources out there if you want to just like learn more about a coach's perspective or just like an outside perspective of baseball. But what you guys are doing right now, just being athletes and playing baseball is probably one of the most valuable things you can do to set yourself up for success as a coach later, just understanding the game, you know, and also just understanding some of the trials and tribulations. Like I woke up this morning and my arm was numb as a 32 year old woman. And so just being able to relate to players in that way, where I went through some of the physical pain that they went through is important. Um, so I think what you're doing right now is like, you're on the right path. Um, you definitely can study the game and you can study statistics would be a good one <laughs> in the future for baseball. Um, understanding some of the scouting processes and stuff. There are plenty of resources out there um, to learn more from like a coaching perspective, but just keep playing is one of the biggest ones. Thank you. <laughs> um, so our next question is gonna be coming from, I believe this is Sarah from upstate New York. 11-year-old um, Sarah Doman, are you there? Yeah. Go ahead and ask your question. All right. And so yeah. thank you again for doing this. And um, so my question is, did, um, did you always want to be an MLB coach? Um, I wanted to be in professional baseball from the time I was in college, yes. Um, I knew that I was going to be in sports. Like, I for sure wanted to work with athletics. I was a Division One softball player, and that was always on my heart to work with a team. And coaching was always on my heart. What's funny is like, I didn't, I didn't always say I want to be a hitting coach. And like, Justine knows I've, you know, I've known Justine for a while. Like I, I, I didn't say I want to be a hitting coach until recently, but I view what I was doing in the weight room as coaching. Like I've always, I've been coaching. And in fact, it's funny because now being a hitting coach is almost easier because the guys want to come in the cages and they want to hit and they want to hit more and endlessly. But as a strength and conditioning coach, you're constantly having to like, you know, push them to do something basically that they don't want to do, which is lift heavy weight and run hard. And so that's difficult. Whereas now they just love to come to the cages. So it's almost been a bit of a weight lifted. Um, but yeah, I've always considered myself a coach and I've been coaching just, I've just been coaching guys in the weight room and developing relationships and pushing them to be better in the weight room. And now I'm coaching the body to do something else in the cages. 
So being an MLB hitting coach hasn't always been my like end goal, but probably over the past like three years, it's been on my mind and just certain mentors tipped me off and wanting to be uh, in the future, I'd really like to be in the front office and doing something in a more leadership role at administration. And so I just viewed being an on-field coach as a vital part of that development because when I become whatever it is, if it's a general manager or president or whatever, I want to be able to have that view of an on-field coach, of a hitting coach, so I can better evaluate players, I can better understand coaches, because right now what we're seeing is the general managers and farm directors in professional baseball are all businessmen that wear suits and ties and maybe have never coached anything ever. So I think to have that lens will be important once I'm in a leadership position so that I can better do my job and understand the coaching realm a little bit better. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thanks Sarah. Um, our next question will be coming from Olivia Keen, 16 year old from Oregon. Olivia, hey, Olivia. Hey, I remember going on like ESPN and I saw your name and it was like Yankees hire MLB coach. And I was like, whoa, that's it. And now we're like talking to you. So that's kind of <laughs> really cool. Um, my question is kind of, you kind of touched on it already, but I said being like the only girl in a lot of situations, there's probably some, we've all felt like disinclu disinclusiveness, I guess. So how do you get the boys and like your surrounding to take you seriously? Like know you're here and like know what's up, you know? Yeah, I think it's, it's like I said, well, first of all, there's, there's, um, okay, two things. It's like I said, like, no matter what I do, I mean, if you look at um, the hitting, the hitting staff for the Yankees is about 10 hitting coaches. Like you've got major league all the way down to the Dominican Republic. And there's about 10 of us. And of all of the 10 coaches, I have more experience in professional baseball than, than uh, all of them, except for one. And so like <laughs> the players see me and there's this very obvious, like I don't belong, you know, it's like an apple amongst all oranges. Like it's very clear. There's one thing that's very different. And so up front, they may not talk to me as much. They may not be around me as much, but I think if you just talk to me for five minutes or if they hear me coach for five minutes or my boss, Dylan Lawson. So the hitting coordinator for the Yankees has done a phenomenal job of like, when we do staff introductions, he's like, and this is Rachel. She's been with the Astros, the Cardinals, the White Sox, LSU, Arizona State. She, like, he, he does a really good job, and he does it on purpose because he knows that I'm the apple and all of the oranges. He does a really good job of, like, basically telling them, like, hey, she might look different, but she has this rap sheet of just, like, a long list of elite-level sports experiences. And so one of the ways that you do it is, like, being good. You know, you got to put in the work. So one of the ways to get respect is you have to put in the work and have the resume and have done the experiences. And it might take them a little time to figure that out because it's not like you walk into a room and hand someone your business card and say, this is what I've done. But if you are, if you've done all of that, then as soon as you talk, they're going to have an idea that you know what you're talking about. So how do you get the respect? Well, first of all, you got to put in the work. That's number one. Number two is I think I think you get their respect by body language. And this is something I've never struggled with. So if you struggle with it, I'm not sure if I'm the best person to coach you on it, but I've always been, I've always been able to look someone in the eye. I've always been able to speak confidently. I was a catcher. That means I was loud and I had to yell how many outs there were. And I had to, I had to project my voice and I had to walk out to the pitcher and get her under control and, figure out what our game plan was and I was always kind of this this I was always a leader I viewed myself as a leader and my coaches allowed that out of me and I think it served me very well so when I was you guys' age I was already kind of like developing these social skills to be able to to walk into a room full of men 20 years later and be able to stand up in front of all of them and give a, a presentation with a confident body language which I know is not something that all women necessarily not all all people for sure men or women but especially women and even young women I think shrink themselves you know and don't speak confidently and don't look people in the eye and they don't feel like they can speak up so I think part of that is I just talk and I like 
I'm in the cages and there's salsa music playing and I'm like dancing in the cages. And I'm this like, this person that even if they were like, what's that girl doing here? Immediately, they're like, oh, she can hang. You know, like they, they're joking with me and I can joke back and I can give them some harsh feedback. I can tell them when something's not going very well. And that's something that you have to practice like now. And I'm like I'm t- talking specifically to you guys, you know, on this call, you've got to start practicing that right now. So I don't know what that means to you. If that's talking to your team after a tough loss as a player, if that's speaking up, if, even if that's, hey, your teammate isn't running hard in conditioning and you got and you got have to look at her and have a tough conversation, look her in the eye and say, hey, I don't think you're putting forth the effort. Like practice that now. I don't know what that means for every one of you on this call, but you can probably think in your mind like, oh, there was this tough conversation that I shied away from or I was in a group of boys because I know you guys play baseball. So that means you probably hang out with a lot of boys. Like I was in a group of boys and I felt like I couldn't say what I wanted to say. You got to practice speaking up now. So in your career, 10, 15, 20 years from now, you don't have to develop that skill. Cause if, if you don't have that skill, you might not make it past the interview process anyway. That was a long answer. But good, good no, answer. Thank you. And I'm a catcher too. So I guess catchers are dope. <laughs> catchers for life. <laughs> Got a lot of catchers on this call. Oh, I think would agree. Of course. <laughs> you guys are savages. I love it. <laughs> Um, all right, our next question comes from Sammy. Sammy, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? If you're asking your question, I guess. Yes. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, um, what do you recommend for people? For, what, what advice do you give for someone transferring from machine pitching to player pitching? And how can the parents at the house help with that? Whoa, yo, can I like audible this question? I, I do not work with this age group enough to answer that. What would I recommend for? <laughs> um, okay, I have some base things, but I will audible to Lena or Justine because I don't work with this age group to know enough about this. But I would say, first of all, give yourself a grace period to fail. So if it's not going very well, that's okay. Okay. Like if you're not doing very well, you're not the first person to ever struggle in this situation. So give yourself some time to adjust, even if that's a full season. Cause when I like, so how old are you? I'm 10. 10. All right. When I was 11, I think, or 12, I literally spent the entire year with the worst batting average on the team the whole year. So much so that the next season, I somehow made the team. They were just being nice, I'm sure. I somehow made the team. I'll never forget, my dad was driving me to practice. And he said, Rachel, he was being a nice dad. And he was like, Rachel, are you sure you want to do this? It was the first year I had played competitive softball. So it was switching from like pretty much slow pitch to fast pitch. And I was, he was like, are you sure you want to do this? And I said, dad, of course, because how else can I go to the Olympics in softball? And my dad actually didn't say anything. And he let me believe that I was going to play in the Olympics. <laughs> so, But I was just so bad. And it took me a while to adjust. And I had I won the game. So I was playing club softball. At, it was like I was 12, let's say. And that was late because some girls started playing at eight and under. They were already playing fast pitch. So I was behind. It just took a while for me to catch up. And I think just... The most important thing is just let yourself fail and keep going up there and trying. And that's really the best I can do. But if you, if Lena or Justine, you want to jump in, jump in, please. Okay. I think that's, that's a great answer. Um, We can definitely email us if you want some other tips and stuff like that. But I think Rachel, that's a great, um, that's a great tip. Um, Thank you. Side of things. Sammy, you have time. You have time. Okay. It's okay to be bad right now. Just if like the fact that you're on this call puts you ahead of probably most of your teammates mentally. So it's just a matter of time before you catch up physically. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Sammy. Um, All right. We've got a question from Ava who is in Canada right now. 
Ava, that sounds horrible. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> Ava, do you want to ask your question? If you're asking it right now, I think you're on mute. Dun, dun, dun. Ava. Ava, where are you at, girl? Okay, Ava, we'll come back to you, okay? Um, all right, our next one is from, question will become from Maggie, who is 14 from New Hampshire. What's up, New Hampshire? Also another catcher. Maggie, I think you're on mute right now. Yep, I just figured that out. There you go. Thank you. Uh, my question is, um, what are your goals, like, during the season or not on the season, but just, like, at this point in your playing career, what are your goals? Um, okay, I hope you guys know that I don't play baseball for the Yankees. Yeah, I meant, I meant coaching. I meant coaching. Okay, okay. I just want to be sure, just so no one thinks that I play baseball for the Yankees yet. yet. Um, <laughs> uh, what are my goals for the season? Gosh, I um, – you know, it's been an adjustment to be a hitting coach. I think coaching the body is very intuitive to me. So in the cages, seeing a swing and being able to break down a swing is very, um, it's a lot like what I used to do. So are they using their hips as well as they could? Are they reaching their hands out? Like I can watch the body very well. Um, something I've done for 10 years. Being in a game situation and really being able to watch an at bat and evaluate it live time and not have to go back and watch video is something I have to get better at. And so one of my goals is just to, I usually sit with another hitting coach right now, or I mean, you know, when spring training was going on, I make an effort to sit next to a hitting coach who I know I really respect his opinion and just like ask questions. Like, what would you, you know, what were you thinking about that pitcher sequence? Like, what did you think was coming? Uh, what's the defense doing here? What should they be doing? Should we be paying? You know, just, I think it's like um, getting my mind back into the game because the last time I thought about a first and third situation was 10 years ago when I was playing. So it's something that I, I just have to like, it's almost like I'm um, learning a language that I knew when I was a kid and it's like coming back to me. So that's something I've noticed that I'm like, oh, I'm a little slow. Like, I'm just like a little, I'm like a little bit behind. I have to go back after the game and watch the film to like, oh, okay, yeah. All right, I should have seen this. The pitcher, this pitcher is thrown first pitch, you know, strike inside to righty hitters every single time. I should have prepared the hitter for that ahead of time. So it's, it's things like that where I'm, I'm working a little, I'm working like very slowly. So that's my goal for the season is just to be um, attuned to like gameplay, I guess. Uh, long term, I, I think I already said it, but like, I, I really think that I'll be a general manager someday. And um, I don't know when, I think I have plenty to learn right now as a hitting coach. Uh, but I do think that I would like to be a general manager, maybe of the Yankees, but I'm open to open to any San Diego sounds nice too. So maybe the Padres. <laughs> Thank you. That sounds awesome. Thanks, Maggie. Um, all right, Taylor from Illinois, who's 17 years old. Um, I know you had a couple of questions, Taylor. Do you want to pick one of them and run with that one? And you're on mute too, Taylor. Okay. Um, can I ask two? Because I had like four. <laughs> um, I lost it. Okay. Um, how are teams using statistics and technology um, with coaching and in strategy is my first question. And then I'll ask my second one once you answer. <laughs> how are teams not using technology and statistics at this point? Um, basically, teams are using technology to better evaluate. I, I shouldn't say better evaluate players. What I should say is to more objectively evaluate players and to create um, databases so that they can scout players better and so I'll try to use like a concrete concrete example of that so for example um, exit velocity off of the bat so if you can hit a ball off of a baseball bat 120 miles an hour that is elite level that's like Stan right that's like elite level power and so if we can collect data on our minor league players and say okay you know you know what this guy doesn't have the best batting average but he's hitting the ball consistently above 95 miles an hour and he's touched 110 miles an hour then we know this guy has the power to maybe you know be successful at the major league level and so it's just really using numbers to like quantify something where instead in the past it might have been like wow that guy 
as Scott might have said, well, that guy looks like he's hitting the ball really hard. Well, now we have the ability to measure these things and put numbers on them so we can better evaluate our, our players without um, chance. So um, this is something that like analysts, our analysts with the Yankees and also analysts with the Astros talk about is trying to take out like the chance of the game. So if a player hits a ball 100 miles an hour and it's caught by the short, you know, the shortstop leaps up and grabs it and it's an amazing play, well, the batter doesn't really get credit for that and their batting average. So the batting average is really not like a great statistic to like evaluate a player, even though there's plenty of correlation to batting average. And, but we just try to basically take chance out of it. So instead of evaluating that player off of batting average, because really he got out, so that's not going to really credit, that's not gonna credit him on a stat line, we'll say. We try to look at stats that are like without, take away the chance, take away the defense, take away, you know, the park or whatever, and try to evaluate just that player's true skill without chance so exit velocity is one of those examples where we we say well the shortstop caught that but he hit 100 miles an hour at a 13 degree launch angle so we're pretty sure if the shortstop wasn't there that ball was going to go out of the park so that's kind of one way i guess to one example okay and then my other question was lots of people talk about baseball teaching them learning how to fail and i was wondering what you think is a good way to learn to fail constructively oh that is such a great question thank you for asking asking that um i always talk about failure strategies and i stole this straight from sue enquist who's a famous softball coach from ucla um i heard her talk about this one time and i just stole it straight from her basically having you have to have a fail a go-to failure strategy so you know how you have like a go-to like when you're in the on deck circle and you're like all right first i uh first i like tied my gloves and then i put the weight on the bat and i swing the bat around and then i time up the pitcher like you know the routine that you have when you're going on deck but what's your routine when you strike out anyone anyone <laughs> like does anyone have a strikeout routine you know so I mean what's it Okay, but good. If, so you've if I strike out, like I imagine that I either don't swing at the pitch, or if I hit it where it would have, where it should have gone, like something like that. Great. So you have a mental process, but also I would encourage you if 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 you're not as uh, mentally prepped as Taylor here, sometimes there's emotions involved. You are upset. It's your third strikeout. How do you tell yourself? No matter what happens, if I strike out when I I run back to the dugout. I put my bat, I set my bat down nicely. I don't throw it. I put my helmet down and I have a little notebook and I write notes about that at bat. And I sit there for 30 seconds and I take five deep breaths and then I let it go. Like, I think that we should have a, a clear strategy because it's easy to say, well, oh, I think about where I would have hit the ball. And I hope that you do that every time. But sometimes when emotions are going on, the game's on the line and it's your third strikeout and you, cannot hit the broad side of a barn it's not as easy if you don't have an already decided process like a very clear failure strategy just like you have a strategy in your in the on deck circle so i think teaching tactical strategies for failure beyond just like oh take a deep breath and think about butterflies like something that you can touch right that you can physically do every time i think is, is important but that, I mean, gosh, that's a really great topic. I could talk about that for a long time. Good question. Thank you. Um, and is there a difference between if you make a mistake in the field versus hitting? Is there a difference? Oh, like would I coach it differently? No. Well, it's, well like the, on the field is an even better one where you see like, okay, someone makes an error and they hang their head and they kick the dirt or they, you know, they toss their glove and they you know catch it or whatever and so this is one that Sue Enquist talked about that coach that I mentioned she um they would practice like in practice not in the game they would practice if someone made an error they had decided on a failure strategy which was my bad and they would call the outs and they weren't allowed to do anything else and the whole team knew it like this is what we're going to do when we make an error so there's no room to do anything else. It's just like, it's, it almost becomes an automatic reaction 
instead of allowing for like whatever your emotions let you do when you're upset, it was like an error. Look, everyone makes errors, right? So there's this like, I don't know what happens when we make an error and like, for some reason we think it's the first time there's ever been an error made in any game ever. Like it happens to everyone, but the way that we react is, is a wide spectrum of things. And so I think just, again, having a strategy for yourself, maybe your whole team can't decide on it like UCLA softball did, but for yourself, what are you going to do if you're a catcher and there's a pass ball? What are you going to do? Because everyone's looking to the catcher to be a leader and you have no time to waste. You can't even waste 10 seconds with bad body language and putting your hand on your hip and looking around like you can't even waste 10 seconds because your team needs you to be back there and be a leader so you go get the pass ball the runner goes and then you toss it back to the pitcher and you call the outs like you have to have your own failure strategy ready and you have to practice it and practice so that in a game it's just natural thanks for your questions taylor Thank you so much. Um, okay, we're going to bounce around a little bit. We're going to go to um, Eliana and Sophia from the Maryland area. Cool. Do you guys want to ask your question? Um, so she has a question and I have a question, but she doesn't want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> why, don't, why don't you ask your question, Eliana? Okay. Um, was it hard not getting responses from teams and even being rejected by a team because of your gender? Like, and how did you overcome that? Uh, it wasn't hard at first because I was so naive. I didn't understand that they weren't calling me back because of my gender. I didn't even understand until one team finally called me back and they said the guy apologized because he couldn't hire me. And then he told me that he had actually called all the other teams that he knew had open jobs and they had also gotten my resume and said, yeah, we got her resume and we can't hire her. So I, it was actually a while before I even realized that. Um, once I did, I think there's, there's a part of me, of course, that it was hard. And I think I even remember like crying or shedding tears or feeling sorry for myself, but I just thought like, this is just like anything else in life. It's, you know, there are some people that, run into a brick wall and then they they're like oh there's a brick wall i'm gonna just gonna go turn around and go back and do something else and then there's people that run into the brick wall and then climb that shit as fast as they can you know like figure out a way they jump or they like they get a friend or whatever and just like find a way and so i think it never occurred to me to, to quit never occurred to me to stop going and at some point also there was a piece of me that said, I know I was given all of these like opportunities, right? My parents were phenomenal. They took me to every softball game. They supported me. I had excellent coaches um, growing up, male coaches who had, who had coached us like we were boys and didn't let us think that we couldn't do anything. I had excellent college coaches. I had these, all these opportunities. I knew that women were in the space you know, I think, I can't remember when I first knew about Justine, but it was probably, I knew, I knew about her when I was getting in. I knew about Sue Falsoni, who was a physical therapist for the Dodgers. And I just thought like, it's my job because I, I know I can do it. I have the knowledge. I've had all these great mentors and it's my job to do this for as long as I can possibly stand it until I get an opportunity because there's some other woman out there that's probably tried to do this and she hasn't had the same mentors who have given her confidence and hasn't had the same opportunities and she gave up. So I, it's like my duty. I feel like I'm responsible to do this. And I, I would just encourage you guys to reflect on this. I know there's some really young people on this call, but because of what you, like you guys are playing baseball, this is so cool. There's, I know that there's a lot of you on this call and I know that, okay, baseball for all like brings all of these, women baseball players together, but relatively speaking, there's not a lot of you out there. So because you've had this opportunity to play and because you've had coaches that have not stopped you from playing, it's your job to somehow pass this on someday. So don't take this lightly and, and try to reflect on this. Even if you're young, think about the responsibility that you have already because you've had an opportunity to be, play baseball. It's your job to somehow pass that on and to keep going as long as you can. And that's, I thought about that when it was going on. I just thought I can't quit because I know there's other women that have quit before me 
and I'm not going to be that person. I'm going to use the opportunities that I've had and I'm going to maximize those. And I just, I think it's, I think it's easy to quit when you're doing it for yourself, but as soon as you feel the responsibility of doing it for someone else, it's much harder to give up. Okay, thank you. Um, Thanks, so, you guys. Um, so how do you use math in your job? Hey, great question, and thank you for asking it. Um, I use it all the time. So like just today, we were running, um, writing some objectives for our players, and we basically have a stat sheet of all of our players, and I have to go through and look at the, stat, the stats. So for example, um, so ex I think exit velocity is an easy one for everyone to understand. So that's how hard you hit a ball. So I had to look at this player's exit velocity and see where he stood compared to the league. Um, the league average and understand if that was good or bad. So I had to basically like understand. And, and by the way, um, I'm fortunate that there are people that work for the Yankees that do this for me. So I don't want to claim that I'm any kind of really smart, fancy pants math person, but I have to understand a little bit. I have to understand what I'm looking at. So for example, like you have to understand if this player is good or bad. And so in order to understand that, you have to understand like what's one standard deviation away from the league average. Does this player fall within that one standard deviation away from the league average? Well then, okay, he's doing okay. If he's one, more than one standard deviation below the league average, then we deem that as not okay. Um, so I have to understand general concepts, but again, I, I'm not claiming to be some fancy math person. <laughs> Uh, because we have people that that's their job to do that for us. But I think um, understanding basic statistics um, in baseball is is huge, especially where it's going in the future. So I hope that answered your question. But ladies, take a statistics class. I'm telling you. <laughs> as, as many as you can. <laughs> like a jet. Um we will bounce over to Nadia, who's a 14-year-old from Alaska. Go ahead, Nadia. Okay. So my first question was, I don't know if you already answered this, but like, what is your favorite, like most productive workout and like the cool down for that workout? Um, can everyone like virtually raise their hand to the screen? Just do this. If you have any kind of like workout equipment at home, ready, go and hold it there. Raise your hand because I'm going to look. Oh, wait. If you have any kind of workout equipment, that means dumbbells or bands. Okay. Oh, there's a lot of you. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. I want to see. Oh, there's a lot of you that have them. Okay, cool. So, all right. You can put your hands down. Okay. So I think just for, for the group I'm talking to, squats do squats legs get your legs super strong do lunges walk up the stairs if everyone rose there a lot of people are raising their hands so if you have dumbbells even if you don't have dumbbells guys you can you can find heavy stuff in your house or get a backpack and fill it up with canned goods like you can do it i showed you that video of that guy whatever you have that's heavy pick it up and do squats and get your legs strong do lunges walk up and down your stairs even if you seriously just like walk up and down your street with a backpack full of canned goods on something that's going to put weight on your body and force your muscles to get stronger um so i'm talking that was like the at-home version i guess cool down that's a really good question cool down could be anything from i think cool down for me my my favorite cool down is just uh some breathing work so I usually like or you could think about I think everyone understands what maybe meditation is so I usually would just lay down in a quiet space after my workout and just get my heart rate down and already start the recovery process by taking five to ten minutes just to breathe so I know that sounds really simple um, but it, it's really just like you can go in your bedroom turn off the lights lay down on your floor and just do breathing exercises all that does is calm down your body. So it basically tells your body like, okay, I'm done working out. Now it's time to start the recovery process. So I usually do just breathing work. Um, if you do have a gym, let's say we're not, let's say coronavirus doesn't exist and you have a gym to go to, go to the gym, ladies, get in the free weight section and start lifting weights. Oh my gosh. 
it's amazing to me when I still go to Gold's Gym these days and I see that I'm the only woman in the free weight section. You've got to start learning how to do that. And I would encourage you, um, I know that not everyone can do this, but if you can, if you're like over the age of 12 on this call, find a way to not get a personal trainer, but if you could even just hire a trainer for a few sessions to just teach you like the basics, because you don't need a personal trainer forever, but just somebody that can teach you how to lift weights. It's so vital. And like to, I think it was Olivia that asked the question, you know, she asked like, do you think a woman could do that? I do think a woman could do that, but I don't think a lot of women train their bodies as hard as is necessary to get that physically strong. So the first thing is, is to increase your muscle mass. Right now at home, it's a little tough, but once you get to the gym, squats, deadlifts, lunges, step ups, bench press. You heard me. Bench press. Yes. Flex. Let's get a flex on. Yeah. Yes, there we go. I like it. Yeah. Okay, so I think I think anything with weight training. I mean, I could get into really in depth specific, but I don't think I have enough time on that on this call. Yeah, I think we only have time for like two or three more questions and we can make them quick. Um I want to go over to Rosie, who's an 11 year old from Chicago. I know she's a really, really big fan. Um, Rosie, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Hey, Rosie. Hi. So, which one do I choose? Okay. How did you get used to be called Ray instead of Rachel? <laughs> That's a good story. Uh, okay, so I. Um, in 2013, I told you ladies, I couldn't get a job. And one of the organizations I applied for told me it was because I was a woman. So I knew that there was some discrimination going on. So the next season, that season went by, I was waitressing, I did an unpaid internship at Arizona State in Phoenix. And then um, the White Sox were awesome. They called me in the fall and they said, Hey, we have this little, we have an internship. It's just 30 bucks a day. It's almost no money. We're really sorry. We don't have a full-time job, but if you want to kind of get your resume going again. So I, I signed up to do that. So I was barely working and, but job, it was the off season. So jobs were starting to come up for the next season. And I was so desperate that I, and I wanted to just make sure that I was going to at least get a call back. Because I thought in my mind, okay, at least if somebody calls me, I might be able to get on the phone with them and then I'll have a good conversation and they'll be like, wow, this girl really could do it. But I mean, to be honest with you, that was never going to work. But I was so desperate. I just, I just thought I would try it. So I changed my name on my resume from Rachel to Ray to sound like a guy, to look like a guy. So I changed that. And I also said, um, instead of like NCAA division one softball player, that was on my resume. I put NCAA division one catcher. So everything was gender neutral. And, um, I sent my resume out to the jobs that I was applying for and it, it worked. So I immediately got some emails back and then I got a phone call a few days later from a number I didn't know. And he said, Hey, can I speak to Ray? And I, I was like, oh my gosh, it worked. And in my head, I was like, what? So I was like, this is she. And he said, he said, it was just this really awkward, long silence. And he was shuffling papers. And he was like, oh, uh, sorry, I just wasn't sure if I had the right name. And I just was like, oh man, this guy was so caught off guard that it's a woman. So I unfortunately couldn't talk at the time. I said, hey, could you call me back tomorrow? Because this isn't a good time. And he said, yeah, I'll call you tomorrow afternoon. Well, I never heard from him again. So I immediately felt like, I think that was very short lived because I felt bad, not bad for lying or anything like that, but just, I just really felt like at the end of the day, if this person doesn't want to hire a woman, then it's probably not the type of human being that I want to work for anyway. So the email, I got like three or four email responses, like just immediately. And I got that one phone call. So I actually ended up replying back to the emails with my actual name Rachel and never heard from those guys again so it just was a I think it was a wake-up call again I was pretty naive to the fact that teams didn't want to hire women but also in the same breath it was really encouraging because as soon as I changed my name I got callbacks and I I was like oh wow like okay I'm doing something right people think my resume is good 
you know, and so I think I, it was a little bit of a weird bit. It was a strange encouragement where, okay, I was still discriminated against, but at least I knew that the work that I was doing was right. And so it was only a matter of time until someone would give me a chance. So that was how, that was me changing my name to Ray. My, my sisters still call me Ray sometimes as a joke. I have like one more question. When did you find out you wanted to coach baseball since you played softball? Oh, um, well, ladies, this is a good lesson to learn too. But the reason why I never used to tell the story, so this is a treat. I never used to say this, but when I was playing softball, I was dating a baseball player in college. And, um, and in fact, when I first started going to his games, I was like, this is so boring. Like baseball's so boring because softball is a much, it's a little different, right? It's quicker, it's a smaller field. It's just a faster game sometimes. Um, but what ended up happening is he played, so he played baseball. We dated for two years in college and then five years total. And um, he ended up playing professionally in the minor leagues for the Dodgers. So as I was starting my career in strength and conditioning, I was secondhand learning about the minor leagues. And I just became so fascinated with their journeys because the Latin American players, the minor league players that go through this long journey to get to the big leagues. And I had no idea about it, even though I was a softball player. So I, I got to really learn the inner workings of the minor leagues. And I, I've always been drawn to working with minor league players because of that. Like I just understood their journeys and they were, I was just so fascinated by the business side of professional baseball. So that's when I really got to learn about like professional baseball specifically. And I knew that I wanted to work in that field. So moral of the story is even if you have an ex-boyfriend, there's not always no value to that person because he's the one who taught me about baseball. So there you go. Thank you. Thanks, Rosie. Okay, we just have one last question. Um, I know we're running a little bit over, um, but Hannah, um, I know you had a bunch of questions. Do you just want to pick one? And that's going to be our last question um, for today. Okay, so I know when people first learn that, like, I play baseball, they always they're always like, oh, well, you just play baseball because, like, you want to date the boys. Like, <laughs> how do I get people to stop thinking that? Um, it's how you act. You know, I think over time, like, for me now, and probably for Justine or whoever, like, this is seven, my seventh year, so I think there's enough people now that know my reputation that – like, even if, even if there was a question like, oh, why is she here? Somebody in the room would go, dude, she's worked for the Cardinals, the White Sox, the Astros. She's never, there's never been a problem. I've never had a problem with people thinking that I'm there for the wrong reasons. And it's because of the way that I act. And so over time, that's when I first got in, it was, it was tough, right? And when I first got in, I very much downplayed my femininity. I would wear larger clothing I would wear all, all men's clothing which is what they gave me anyway but I mean I didn't try to wear fitted clothing because I just knew that I again I knew that I was going to have to prove myself and I was okay with that because I was different so I would say just like they'll probably stop thinking that if you just act like a professional you know and act and when I say that that means to you I don't know how old you are but to you that means you show up to practice you work hard you do your work yeah, you're friends with people, but you don't get flirtatious with people and you don't, you know, it's like, you just, it's the way that you act and over time, they're not going to think that. And then over time, if somebody is like, oh, why does that girl play there? Your teammates are going to be like, dude, she's the hardest worker on the team and she's the smartest one and we love playing with her and it's not a big deal. So even if someone does have a question, it'll be squashed because of your reputation. But the first thing you've got to do is work, you know, and just show people what you're going to do. Thank you. Awesome. You guys are awesome. I love this. It was so inspiring. Thank you for all your great questions. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much um, to everyone who joined us today. I know we ran a couple minutes over, but um, huge thanks to everyone from literally around the world who came to join us today. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions, but um, we will try and do more of these um, down the road. And um, thank you again, Rachel, for helping all of us stay more connected to the game during this time and with each other and um, sharing this time with us today. Thank you guys. You are 
inspiring to me. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Lane and Justine, for having me. Thank you, Justine, for being the OG coaching and, and setting all this up and, and providing opportunities for young women. It's awesome. You guys are great. Thank you, guys. Stay safe and well. We'll uh, see you all Thanks. soon.